Good morning. It is such a pleasure to see everyone. Thank you all for being here. I, I like the little uh, snowflakes that we have there. We had those in the early service as well. Uh, I wish that were more representative of our weather this time of year. It'd be nice to get a little bit of cold weather, but uh, I don't want to be com grumbling and complaining. No, you don't want the cold weather? I don't know, I guess I'm crazy that way. I like the cold weather. I like to be warm in the cold weather, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Well, this morning we continue in Luke, in, in Luke's gospel, and uh, the account of the early days and weeks here of Jesus Christ. We haven't gotten quite to the end of chapter 2. We're, we're going to meet Simeon today, and, and what Luke is giving us here in, in, in this gospel really is, is history, but it's not just history. What he's giving us is assurance through the testimonies of those that were here. I'm sorry, those that were there. And we remember, of course, how Luke begins his gospel he says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke has a goal in what he's telling us here. That those of us who already believe might be strengthened and encouraged in our faith, firmly rooted, not only in the historicity of Christ, but in who he is, in what he has said and done, what he is now doing, and what he has promised to do in the future. This is for you, believer, but not just the believer, it is also for those who don't believe that you too might come to the saving knowledge of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as John said at the close of his gospel, these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. These aren't just important facts. Unim these aren't just, uh, I'm sorry, unimportant facts, unimportant random details about the life of Jesus. There is a Holy Spirit-inspired purpose behind them. For you, Christian, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God might be adequate and equipped for every good deed. And for the non-believer, it is a testimony, a testimony of eyewitness accounts on par with the most respected historical accounts of all time. There are few, if any, historical events from this time period that we have more solid and reliable information than this. And I want to, by way of introduction, just give you a brief example. Take Julius Caesar, for example. How many of us have been taught in school about Julius Caesar, his life, his reign, his, his, his murder? We don't doubt what we know about Julius Caesar, do we? Well, you might find it interesting to know that all that we know about Julius Caesar, most of it comes from just a handful of sources, just a very few handful of sources. Most of it actually comes from two that were written over 120 years after the life of Julius Caesar. And with, as it is with most historical records, we don't have those original writings detailing his life. They've been lost to history, but we do have copies of them, people that have, had written them down in manuscripts in order to preserve the record. And you might further be surprised to learn that of these copies of the history of Julius Caesar, all that we have in existence today is about 60, about 60 copies. And even more surprising than that, these 60 manuscripts that we based all our historical data about Julius Caesar only date back to about 400 AD at the earliest. Most of them actually date back from 900 to 1200 AD. 60 manuscripts copied anywhere from 500 to 1300 years after the original writings. Now compare that to what we have in the New Testament. 27 letters, all written within 70 years of Christ's life, more than half of them written within 30 years. We don't 
of course, have any of the original letters either. They've been lost to history, but instead we, instead of 60 copies of manuscripts, we have over 20,000 copies of manuscripts. And instead of those manuscripts being copied 500 to 13 years, 100 years later, the earliest we have dates from less than 100 years. Daniel Wallace, a world-renowned expert on New Testament manuscripts and, and, and New Testament criticism, says there is absolutely nothing in the Greco-Roman world that comes even remotely close to this wealth of data. We are more sure about what Luke wrote in his gospel than we are about the history of Rome. And because Luke's gospel has been proven time and time again to be an accurate historical record, you can trust the testimony of this letter more than you can trust the much of the ancient history of Rome. So this morning, as we come to the testimony of this man, Simeon, if you have yet to place your trust in Jesus Christ, I want you to listen carefully to this historical, historically consistent testimony about him. This is the truth of the Savior, God's Son, Jesus Christ, who lived, died, rose again, so that you might have eternal life in him. Luke has thus far been providing for us a long list of witnesses. He began with Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary. Even the infant John in the womb testified through his actions. We heard the testimony of the shepherds and the angels on high, and even Joseph and Mary in their obedience to follow the law testified to who Christ is. All of them declared to be reliable witnesses, either by the Holy Spirit's direct testimony of their righteousness before God, or as seen through their actions as faithful believers. Altogether, what we have is a series of reliable historical witnesses, godly people, true believers, whose words and actions give testimony to this infant child. And their testimony is that he is exactly who God says he is. He is the Son of God, our Savior Christ the Lord. And all of these people that we've heard so far, all of them trusted God's word. They didn't just trust in their own works to save them, they trusted in what God said, that God would provide a way for their sins to be forgiven. That he would provide a lamb, a perfect sacrifice to take away their sins. In a word, they trusted God's grace. They trusted in his grace. Salvation has always been by God's grace, through faith and God's promises to provide forgiveness for our sins. It's never been about works. And so these people that we've met so far, because they believed God and they trusted his word, they longed for the day when God would send his anointed one, the Christ, to save his people. This was the hope of every true Old Testament believer, the coming Christ. And today, this is the hope of every true New Testament believer, the returning Christ. What we have here in the first two chapters is, is a reliable historical record of the testimonies from all these people and the angels that the truth that Christ has come. So this morning, we meet yet another true believer in God. We meet Simeon. And we're going to meet this spirit-led man who had a spirit-led encounter and then we're going to hear him give a spirit-led praise and a spirit-led prophecy. So with that very long introduction, allow me to also ask the Lord's blessing on our time. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity yet again that you have gifted us with this day that we can gather together, like-minded believers, all with one heart, a heart that loves you and seeks to draw close to you through your word. We praise you, Father, for your word, for it is truth. It is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. And we're so gracious and grateful for it, Father. Help us this morning to look into your word. I pray, Father, that it would strengthen us and encourage us. And I pray, Lord, that you would guard my lips, that what is done here this morning is done by your power and not mine. And help us, Father, to trust you all the more as we look into your word and we pray in Christ's name, amen. So let's meet this man, Simeon. <clears throat> 
Who was he? We begin in verse 25. He says, And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. And so right off the bat, not much is really revealed as far as details about Simeon. We know he's in Jerusalem, but we don't really know if that's where he lives or if he's visiting. We know his name is Simeon, which means God has heard. But apart from that, we don't know much else. We don't know his age, although many, many suggest that he was quite old, probably because of his readiness to, di to die that he expresses in verse 29. But again, we don't really know this. We don't know his profession. Some have suggested that he was a priest, and that's why he was at the temple. But there's no reliable uh, testimony to this anywhere. There's no reliable source for this information. This is all Luke gives us about this man, about his details, is his name. But Luke does tell us something about him. He tells us what matters most about him, his spiritual condition. He was dikaios, righteous, he says. The very first thing he mentions about this man, the most important thing, is that he is righteous. Now, when God declares somebody righteous in the Bible, it's the, it's, it's the same as saying he is justified. This means he was one who knew God in a saving way through faith. He had fellowship with God, for he was a forgiven man justified, excuse, excuse me, justified by God, by grace, through faith. He was a man declared righteous by God. Not only was he a true believer, forgiven, declared righteous before him, but he was also eulabes, which means devout. Now, in secular writings, this word can mean conscientious and, and cautious. But in the Bible, it always refers to those who are God-fearing, reverent, or pious. Luke's actually the only one that uses this word in the New Testament, in, in Luke and in Acts, and it always refers to those who took their faith seriously. Faithful men. So not only was Simeon a forgiven man declared righteous by God, but he was a faithful man. In other words, he was a sanctified man. You could say of Simeon that he was a man who lived quorum Deo, before the face of God. He lived out the salvation he held within. His was a life of reverence for God, reverence for his law, and reverence for his holiness. Luke had said this about Zacharias and Elizabeth back in chapter 1 and verse 6 when he, he said they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. He said something similar about Mary when he said that, that she was graced by God, that God was with her. She was a recipient of God's grace. That's to say that she knew his forgiveness. She and Joseph were not only righteous before God, they were also careful to keep the law of God. We see this down in verse 39 of chapter 2. We'll, we'll come to this in another message. when he, It says, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. Luke is telling us here that not only are these believing people, but they're devout people. They're devout people, giving further strength to their testimonies. They are to be taken seriously, for they are not flaky believers. They're not like the easy belie believism of today. Those that profess faith, but don't possess faith. Their testimonies are reliable. Everything they say and do concerning this child, Jesus Christ, speaks to their unwavering faith that he is exactly who God says he is. So we meet this man, Simeon, one of the faithful remnant in Israel, a true believer, a devout man, and, and, and next we learn something about his theology. It says he was looking for the consolation of Israel looking for the consolation of Israel. This could be translated the comfort of Israel. He has in sights the coming Messiah, is what this means. He was looking up, looking forward to the day when the Christ would come. In Jewish eschatology, the Christ, the Christ was called the Menachem, which means the comforter, the one who would deliver God's people Simeon knew that the Menachem would come because he believed God's promise of him. 
You see, Simeon didn't spiritualize God's word. He didn't allegorize it. He took God's word literally. And so he longed for the Christ. He waited for him. He kept looking for the promised son of righteousness who would bring healing in his wings. Well, next we learn that he was one whom God had chosen to be used by God for a very special purpose. It says, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, when we hear the Holy Spirit is upon someone, we might think that he's speaking about the indwelling spirit that every New Testament believer experiences, right? But that's not what Luke is saying here. Simeon is an Old Testament believer. So what does this mean? Well, in the Old Testament, God's Spirit was always with his people, but he did not dwell permanently within him as he does now. The indwelling Holy Spirit didn't come about until Pentecost. We talked about a little bit about this this morning in Bible study. In John chapter 14, Jesus is about to go to the cross, and he's giving some parting words to his disciples. And we read in verses 16 and 17, Christ says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. And he's speaking of the Holy Spirit here. That, the, that is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you, and will be in you. And he's talking about the coming Pentecost, that, that feast when, when the Holy Spirit came down, manifested in tongues of fire, and, and empowered the people, the, the disciples, to speak in languages that were not their own. But then he stayed with them. He began to permanently indwell God's children. Before this time, in the Old Testament era, the Spirit of God was always with his people, but he didn't permanently indwell them. So in the Old Testament era, when we read of God's Spirit being upon somebody, it speaks of a special anointing by the Spirit. This God's Spirit coming upon somebody for the purpose of accomplishing something through that person by the power of God's Holy Spirit. So back in Luke, when we read of Simeon, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, he's not talking about that Christian indwelling of the Spirit, but rather the special anointing of the Spirit for a very special purpose. And what was that special purpose? Why did God give him the anointing of the Holy Spirit here? Well, that's exactly what we're going to read about. He is to meet Mary, Joseph, and Jesus at the temple. He's to give this very special praise to God and a prophecy about Jesus' work. All of this is meant to be a testimony not only to Mary and Joseph and not only to all the Jews I'm, I'm sure he told about this in his day, but also to all in the future who would read his words in Luke's gospel. Simeon is a righteous and God-fearing man, faithful and devout, longing for the coming Christ, and he is led by the Spirit of God not only to live out that holy life, but also led by the Spirit to testify that Jesus is the Christ. God had primed this man for the task as well. He had primed him. We read in verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now this is truly astonishing. This is absolutely amazing that God had told Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ, until he had seen the Messiah. This truly is an astonishing thing. What an amazing gift this must have been for him. But there is a very special purpose to it. Now, we don't know exactly how this happened, whether he received this revelation in a dream or in a vision or, or some other way. We don't know when this happened whether it, were, it might have been days before or years before. We don't know. But we know that Simeon trusted God so that when it was revealed to him, he knew it was, it was true, it was going to be. Can you imagine getting this kind of revelation? You're a first century Jew living in Israel. You've watched your nation be oppressed by the pagan Gentile nations of the world. Probably your whole life you've seen that. 
You've watched your nation slide further into apostasy. The people you love, whether it be through the liberalism of the Sadducees or the legalism of the Pharisees or the politicism of the Zealots. Imagine the pain of watching this happen. And ever since God gave you this promise that you wouldn't die until you saw the Christ you've been waiting for, longing for, anticipating his arrival. Each morning, waking up, wondering, is this the day? Could today be the day when I see the Lord's Christ? So that by the time Jesus was born, you are so very, very ready. And now, however long after it was revealed to him, the day has finally come. Simeon is ready. And we read in verses 27 and 28, And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought, him, brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, So he's in Jerusalem at the temple, and perhaps this is where he went every day. We don't know, but he's there this day. By the leading of the Spirit of God, he encounters this young Jewish couple who had come to the temple with Jesus, who was only about six weeks old at this point. They had come to dedicate him to the Lord and to offer up the redemption price for their firstborn son, all according to the law of Moses. And we talked about that a bit last time. Now, it wasn't required by the law that they go to the temple to offer this uh, redemption price. But no doubt, by the leading of God's Spirit, they had determined to do it this way, to do it at the temple. And so here they are in Jerusalem at the temple when Simeon meets them. Now, because Mary was there and women could only go so far into the temple complex, he probably met them, I would imagine, in the court of the women, which was part of the inner courtyards of the temple. There were, there were several divisions, the court of the Gentiles being the largest and the furthest outside. Gentiles couldn't get any closer. And then inside the Gate Beautiful on the eastern side of the inner sanctuary was the court of the women. And this was a large courtyard. Uh, according to the Temple Institute, it was 135 cubits squared. And that roughly means it was 40,000 square feet of courtyard. That's a pretty large area. You can fit over 6,000 people in 40,000 square feet. A very large area with many people in it moving in and around. And the point is this it would have been all too easy to walk right by somebody you knew and never see them, let alone somebody you didn't know. This was a Holy Spirit-led encounter. So as they bring Jesus into the temple to do for him according to the custom of the law, the Spirit of God orchestrated this meeting. Now I find it a little bit strange personally that seems that Simeon just walks up and picks up the boy Jesus. I don't know about you. I don't know how other women would react to a stranger coming and picking up their child. I know how my wife would react, and that probably wouldn't go well for the stranger. But of course, this isn't just some random stranger. Although they've never met before, God had ordained this meeting. Maybe there were some words exchanged first, we don't know. Maybe he said, the Holy Spirit has led me here to see you, to see this child. I know he's the Christ. However it happens, Luke's, Luke tells us that he takes him up into his arms. Now picture that, picking up the Lord Jesus Christ as an infant into your arms, to hold him. Here he is, the one you've been waiting for, the comforter of Israel the Savior, Christ the Lord, as an infant. What joy must have filled his heart. How his face must have shined forth with that joy. As he holds the child Jesus, his heart erupts in spirit-led praise to God. He took him into his arms, blessed God, and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. This is the final hymn of praise or song of praise in the opening chapters of Luke's gospel. It's often called the nunc dimittis from the Latin, which is the, the first two words of, in the Latin of, the, of this phrase, now, now, uh, now let depart. With the baby Jesus in his arms, Simeon is overwhelmed by the peace of God, knowing that his soul is secure in the presence of the Christ. He can depart now. God has promised that he would see him, and here he is. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. In other words, Lord, now I can die. Now I can die You're... because I've seen your salvation just as you said, according to your word, he says. And shouldn't this really be our response to Jesus as well? We're not given the privilege of holding Jesus in our arms, but we no less embrace him with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength when we place all of our trust in him. As Christians, we too can have this same ultimate peace about our lives, knowing that we have experienced God's salvation in Jesus Christ. There's nothing here on this earth that we cling to, for our home is in heaven, our future is with God, our hope is in Christ. The longing of our heart is the same as Simeon's. Whereas he longed to see Christ come, we long to see him return. Now Simeon here calls God despotos, absolute ruler or master. And he calls himself bondservant or doulos, a slave. He is willing to stay here on this earth as long as the Lord wants him to. For he is but a bondservant and God is his master. So what is Simeon's testimony here about Jesus? Well, he says he's the source of salvation, he's the light to all Gentiles, and he is the glory of Israel. What God had promised in the Old Testament and what he has promised personally to Simeon, God is now fulfilled. The Savior, Christ the Lord, has come. Simeon knows that this little child is the Savior. I imagine it was probably sometime after this, uh, this song that he sang or the prophecy or, or at some time in the middle, he said, what is the child's name? To which they would have, of course, replied, his name is Yahweh Saves, a fitting name. And notice something that Simeon doesn't say here. He doesn't say, my eyes have seen the beginning of your salvation. He doesn't say, my eyes have seen part of your salvation. No, he says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Jesus is God's salvation. Christ is sufficient to save all. He's all we need. It's not Jesus plus our efforts or plus anyone or anything else. Jesus Christ is all we need. Salvation is found in him and him alone. Do you want to know what salvation is? Look into the face of Jesus Christ with eyes of faith through the power of Scripture. Simeon can testify that he's seen God's salvation in full because he has seen Jesus. Furthermore, he says that salvation is God's work here, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. And it's a work for all people, encompassing both Jewel, uh, Jews and Gentiles alike. It's not a salvation rever reserved just for the Gentiles. He says he's a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And now this is a reference to several passages in Isaiah. In Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 specifically speaks of the coming light of Christ shining forth from Galilee. God had promised to save Israel, but also the whole world. Gentiles also because Jesus is the light of the world who brings salvation to all mankind, shining forth the light of God's truth and holiness. He is the glory of your people Israel, Simeon says. 
Jesus Christ is the reason God chose these people. He chose Israel through whom to give the revelation of his truth. He chose them with whom to make his covenants. He, God chose Israel as the peoples from which God would raise up his horn of salvation. Jesus Christ is the glory of Israel. He is their perfect pro- prophet, his, the, their perfect priest, their perfect king. He is the full realization of the glory of Israel. He's what they should have been. Luke continues in verse 33. He says, And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Simeon's heart overflowed with joy and praise to God for the Redeemer of Israel. The Savior has at long last arrived. And Simeon's testimony before them only added to their amazement. And this is that word thumadzo again. We saw this back in verse 18 when the shepherds made known what the angels had told them to all the people. And it says that all who heard it were wondered, it says, thumadzo. They were amazed at all that was happening. I mean, how could they not be, really? I mean, what God does is amazing. So we've met this spiritual man, the spirit-led man, Simeon, a righteous and devout man of God who longed to see the Lord's Christ. We've seen how the Holy Spirit led him and Mary and Joseph with Jesus to this divinely appointed encounter. We've seen how the Holy Spirit was upon him, inspiring Simeon for the purpose of giving this amazing testimony and song of praise. And now we see how he is also prepared by the Holy Spirit to give a parting blessing and a prophecy of the work of Jesus Christ. In verse 34 and 35, he says, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The encounter ends with a blessing for them all and a special word for Mary. He says, this child of yours, Mary, he has been appointed by God for judgment and salvation, for the fall and rising of many in Israel. The joy and the amazement of this spirit-filled encounter where he had just said that Jesus Christ is God's salvation extended to all peoples, the message suddenly takes a turn. Simeon looks at Mary, perhaps as he's handing the child back to her, and says, with this child comes a great division. A great division. Many will fall, and many will rise. Anastasis is the word for rise. It means resurrection. Simeon is referring again to Isaiah, this time chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Speaking of the coming Christ, Isaiah writes, Then he shall become a sanctuary, but to both the the houses of Israel a stone to strike and a rock to stumble, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them, then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught." John spoke of Jesus as the true light who came to his own, that is Israel, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Paul speaks of Christ as a stumbling stone to Israel in Romans 9, verses 32 and 33. He says, he says, many in Israel don't attain to the righteousness of God because, quote, they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, and he quotes Isaiah 28, behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed, end quote. Jesus Christ will be a stumbling stone to many. He will be salvation for all those who trust in him, but he will be damnation to those who reject him. 
This is why Paul declares to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.22, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Jesus is a stone of offense. He's a stumbling block to all who seek to draw close to God through any other way, through religious efforts, self-righteousness, or any other false god. But for those with faith who trust in his name, he's a stone of salvation. As, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.7, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Christ is our very cornerstone. He has been appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. And he goes on in verse 34 to say, And for a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. One commentator says this, The way people speak about Jesus Christ is evidence of what is in their hearts. He is not only the salvation stone and the judgment stone, but he is also the touchstone that exposes what people are really like." End quote. Jesus will be a sign. That is to say, he, he's a test as to the true condition of every person's heart. Do you truly love God? Do you truly believe him? Do you seek to know him? Well, Jesus Christ is the test. He's the sign. Israel was being tested by the arrival of the Lord's Christ. He was God's salvation to them. And they, in large part, failed the test. They rejected their Messiah, the Menachem, the comforter of Israel. But they're by their rejection of Jesus as the Christ, great opposition will arise against him. And Simeon, being led by the Spirit of God, sees this and tells Mary. So great will be their rejection that their opposition will, resort, will result in a sword will pierce even your own soul. You know, back in her Magnificat, Mary sang of how the future generations would call her blessed but now she learns that along with that will come great sorrow. Simeon's telling her that Jesus will die. That is the sword that will pierce her own soul. He will die because of their rejection of him. They will oppose him to the point of killing him. He has come to bring salvation, but they will instead seal their own damnation by rejecting him. Jesus came to bring God's salvation to all who would believe and judgment for all who would reject. It boils down to one simple thing. For those who have true faith in God, they believe in his son. For those who trust in anything or anyone else, they reject him. Jesus is the touchstone. He exposes the true nature of the hearts of men to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed, Luke writes. How you answer this one simple question determines your eternal future. Who is Jesus Christ? Was he simply a man? Perhaps a good man, a prophet of God, a good teacher, a wise man. Was he a lunatic? self-deluded man who claimed to be God? Or is he who God says he is? Who all these credible witnesses testify that he is? The Son of God, the Holy One of God, Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior Christ the Lord. Your life will all boil down to that one question. <laughs> who is Jesus of Nazareth? Paul says in Romans 9.9 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul's not saying here that mere empty words will save you. Confession means to stand with, 
It's homologeo in the Greek. It means, it means to say the same thing as. To say the same thing about Jesus that God says about him. To confess him as Lord is to say that he is your kurios, your Lord, your master, the Lord of your life. He is your master and you are his bond slave. And it is a confession that is accompanied with faith in all that God has said and done through him to the point that you believe in your heart that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was fully accepted by God the Father as the perfect sacrifice that takes away your sins. God raised him up, accepting him as the perfect sacrifice because he paid in full the sins of all who would believe in his name. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Luke is giving you reliable testimony after testimony that he who is, that, that he is who God says he is. You are being tested right now. You are being tested. Here as you listen to the truth of God's word, the truth of, of God's testimony written here in the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this testimony that there is salvation in no other name, God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For I and the Father am one. Won't you trust in him? We plead with you. Won't you trust in him? Listen to him, follow him, and trust in him. To reject him is to be lost forever. For he is the revealer of men's hearts, and only those with hearts of faith will know God. John says in 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So for us who do believe, we don't live for the now. We live like Simeon looking forward, looking up. I mean, we do live in the now, of course. We have to pay our bills, go to work, do all the things we have to do. We live in the present, but with a vision of what is to come. We live for Christ. We live for his kingdom. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and the promises of the eternal glory to come, it can become all too easy to grow weary, and complacent, compromising, and to fall into sin. The Christian's hope is rooted in the return of Christ. We will one day and soon stand and behold the beautiful face of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember that. Remember that. Next time you're tempted to sin or next time you feel yourself growing weary, Remember that we will see him again, and you'll find your strength and your resolve in that. In closing, turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and unworldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord. What a joy it is to know your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to have the peace of knowing that, that he's coming again, that where he is now, one day soon, we will be there also. I pray, Father, for any that might be here or listening online who 
who don't know you, who don't know your son. Won't you please, Father, this day, reveal him to them. Open blind eyes and deaf ears. Help them to see, Father. And for us who do know, Father, strengthen our faith in him. Help us, Lord, as we seek to, to walk in a, in a manner worthy, as we seek to please you with our lives, as we seek to live in your holiness. Help us, Father, to remember that soon we will be with him, that he is coming back to save us from the wrath to come. And oh, how we long for that day, Lord. We long for his return. Bless your people this day, Lord, I pray. Encourage our faith. Demonstrate the power of your salvation in our lives. Help us, Father, as we, as we strive to live out those ho uh, holy life before you. Just as Simeon did just as Mary and Joseph did, and just as all the saints of God have throughout all of time. Strengthen our faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.